Welcome back. Time now for Darren Sisson's top picks here on Market Call on BNM Bloomberg. Number one, Bayer AG, ticker symbol B A Y N in uh, Paris, I believe. Correct. Uh, Frankfurt. Yeah. Frankfurt. There you go. Yeah. So, so Bayer is. Uh, priced at about 50 cents on the dollar relative to its peer group. So 2018, they, um, they bought the Monsanto uh, business. Uh, it wasn't pre- uh, uh, well risk managed and uh, the, the roundup liability ultimately halved the company. Um, so that's being dealt with, well provisioned. There will be a little bit of provisioning moving forward. And then on the pharma side, you've got three new drugs coming online and they have uh, one drug that although it's just uh, hit um, a patent cliff, uh, there's no near term competitor. So I think moving forward, you've got a, a, a bio, uh, sorry, a pharma uh, chem, uh, ag chem, uh, behemoth, priced 50 cents on the dollar, sustainable dividend, um, and uh, best, best positioning in terms of that space. You probably will see a spin out of the, uh, of the herbicide business long term. So um, we think this is a good three to five year hold from a risk reward uh, basis, particularly. The pricing is very attractive. Okay. Number two, Jardine Matheson, ticker symbol J-A-R-L-F, and that is the -the over-the-counter exchange in New York, correct? Yeah, and the main listing is in Singapore. But, you know, I think this is a a company that's been in Hong Kong for, uh, based in Hong Kong for 150 years, pan operations. Uh, I think what I'm particularly liking here is that uh, the... Chinese, um, obviously, political pressure that they're feeling has really negatively impacted a lot of the Asian stocks, so they're very heavily discounted. But the underlying performance has improved. Uh, with this particular company, there's a number of catalysts. The Indonesian Indonesian assets, uh, particularly tied to the mining space and, their, and the broader Indonesian economy. You've got any recovery in the real estate market. You've got any recovery in the uh, supermarket stocks or the hotel chains. And then you've obviously got deployment of excess capital as well. So. Um, pre the uh, the uh, Trump regime attack on China, this was actually um, well uh, a very good total return story. So we think now, attractively priced, time to take a look again. Okay, final top pick, uh, bringing it closer to home, TC Energy, ticker symbol TRP on the TSX, a, a giant obviously in the pipeline business and a company that has announced a significant restructuring uh, coming in its near term future. There's the stock down 30, nearly 32% over the past year. Yeah, so we've relatively recently added it. So, you know, as, as viewers know, we are value buyers. Uh, so effectively, you've got a, almost an 8% dividend yield, you've got some assets being sold. Um, you've got uh, obviously the uh, pipeline to the west coast, which is, is going to enable Canadians to actually get top dollar rather than getting skinned by the Americans on our uh, on our energy meal to the US. It'll give two alternatives. Uh, then you've got some growth, uh, dividend growth moving forward. You've got a better balance sheet. And um, should we get a recession, interest rates will moderate lower. And if that's the case, then um, we currently have a two, a relatively almost a two x in terms of money market. Uh, if it goes in excess of 2x uh, for money market returns, then I think uh, investors will find that attractive and uh, deploy some capital here. So, stable operation. Your thoughts on the restructuring? If the restructuring goes ahead, TC Energy will be a natural gas infrastructure pure play, and the oil pipeline business will be another company. I, I think you, you want to think about whether or not you want both pieces. Um, I, I've always found it irking that Canadians get 50 cents on the dollar for our energy assets. Um, and I think if there's a way around that, um, that's going to be um, posi- uh, positive. And I think in terms of the, uh, the carbon component, I don't think carbon as a, as, a, as a source of energy is going away anytime soon. So there will be continuing demand, there'll be chemical demand, there's a lot of demand. So I think the actual entity, if it was fully broken up, you look at it on that basis, there's value. So uh, the question becomes how the spin out is structured, do you get it as a butterfly, those, those types of things, or is it just a net uh, reduction? So look at each component uh, on a careful basis would be my view. Okay, Darren, on behalf of our viewers, thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome back to Market Call. It's time now for Top Picks. That's everyone's favorite segment uh, when our guest picks uh, three top choices. And the first one that Keith brought us today is the iShares TSX Global Gold Index ETF. So this is XGD on the TSX. Why do you like this name? Okay, so you know, say that three times. Oh fast, my gosh, right? no way. So I, I like gold in general uh, for several reasons. Um, 
the, the I like the commodity sector and gold's a commodity. Um, U.S. dollar is probably near a support level right now, but I suspect it might not be returning to its strength anytime soon. So the gold, gold index, gold itself can do very well. You know, they have a negative dollar. correlation. They have right? a negative, that's yeah. right, they're non, what's called yeah, uh, negative correlated. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, there's that. And then from a technical perspective, like it, this is the, the, uh, the producers haven't kept up with the gold bullion. Mm. So I think there's some catch up. Um, not the stuff you put on your hot dog, but um, <laughs> um, so th there's probably a, you know, a little bit of potential to get back at least to 20 bucks on the index and mm. uh, this ETF, I should say. So it's got a, and, and also seasonally, there's some, some seasonal um, pressures that move from about mid-August in through to about the end of September, which tends to be a volatile period on the stock market. So all in, uh, I like it for a, a move, but remember I'm that three month person, I was just right? going to ask so, what your timeline you know, was here so for this. So it's 20 bucks, like I'm not looking for this big long, I'm not a gold bug, I'm not mm -hmm. an anything bug by the way, so I just buy and sell based on what the charts are telling me. So this looks like it might be, you know, make make 10% in the in the next couple, three months and, and see what happens from there. Got it, let's go to Nutrien now. Um, why do you like this name at this particular moment? Well, we have traded this stock lots of times, and uh, you know, clients that are maybe listening to me on the show know that we've been in and out. Um, so, you know, we like these little patterns. Um, this right now, it, it was in a downtrend. We we uh, sold out on a break up there somewhere, and, and kind of left the stock alone. It rallied, and it looks like it's it's kind of. Um, starting to look like a, a breakout. So what we think is that it has at least potential to get back to the old lows again, mm. that trading side of my world. But you know, what we'll do is uh, if, it, if it moves up through that last set of lows, um, we'll keep holding it. Mm -hmm. But if it fails there and starts to roll over, then we get out. So we like the stock for the short term for sure and maybe longer. Okay, and finally, you brought us Wheaton Precious Metals. So that's WPM on the TSX. Looks like it's been a little bit choppy mm -hmm. over the past few years. Yeah. Why do you like the name? Well, it's again a, a trade. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's Wheaton has always been known as more of a silver miner, but mm -hmm. they do have gold in there too. And uh, it's just another play. And you can see on this chart, there's sort of um, <clears throat> you know little bit of a lid, um, but my thoughts are it would at least reach that, but possibly get into the higher level if gold itself, which this is a little bit more weighted towards silver, but if gold itself continues to do well and the producers do well. So mm -hmm. I think it will get dragged along with the producers a bit. And again, I'm I'm not greedy. I just mm -hmm. look for a move and then <laughs> move on. Right. So. Got it. Nice and nimble. Yeah, you like gotta, I think you got to be nimble, especially when this this market itself is, like we mentioned, a little overbought. There's a little bit too much exuberance. Mm. So I don't, I don't especially want to be thinking too long term right now. I'll go back to thinking long term when I feel the risk is lower. Robert's first idea is Northwest Company, their northern retailer. I think they're in the Caribbean too. They are. They're in a couple of remote regions, and that seems to be one of the key common elements to where their stores are. Uh, so yeah, for many people, this is not really a household name, uh, but Northwest has roots to being the second oldest company in Canada after the Hudson's Bay Company. They were uh, the Montreal-based fur trader, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. They're the Montreal-based yeah. fur trader yeah. that date back to 1779. Whoa. So it was way back before Confederation, almost 100 years before Confederation. Uh, you know your history, Andy. That's, that's very impressive. Uh, today, fortunately, the company is quite a bit different than its fur trading past. So it's a retailer of food, clothing, and small appliances. Uh, just imagine walking into a Walmart Walmart store, uh, which is a, you know, a big space, and around the edges you, know, you have a pharmacy, you have a, a dry cleaner, mm -hmm. an eye care specialist, maybe a Tim Hortons. Uh, and so Northwest Company is very similar to this format. The difference is that most of their stores, to your point, are in remote locations. Mm -hmm. They've got a few stores in the Car Caribbean, some in the South Pacific, but most of their stores are in the North 
Canada's north, also in Alaska mm -hmm. as well. And so being in such remote communities, it means that competition is, is very limited. So they've got competition in two forms. First of all, mom and pop little convenience stores that basically sell uh, canned goods. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, if you want to go to a big box store, uh, you can do that, but you got to hop in the car and you got to go for quite a, a long drive, often many, many hours away. So as a result, there's not a lot of competition. We like that. That's sort of a, a natural economic moat for the company. Uh, it means that they have pricing power. It also leads to higher profitability. Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising when you look at the profitability of this company, it's much better than the TSX average. It also pays a really impressive yield that's, uh, I think, about 4.5%. Mm -hmm. So we like the yield. Uh, the multiple uh, is attractive right now as shares have pulled off. Uh, just because they, they missed their earnings estimates due to higher inflation. That's a normal issue right now. And uh, so we, we like the company, good valuation and good yield. That's why we like it. Dividend yield of about 4.8%. Uh, uh, your next idea, TC Energy. Some have questioned this plan to break the company up. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is a little bit of a contrarian pick right now, but, you know, if you want to make money, you can't do what everyone else is doing. So headquartered in Calgary, uh, this is an energy company, energy infrastructure company, formerly referred to as TransCanada Pipelines. Uh, it has a huge portfolio of oil and gas pipelines that connect supply from the production basins to various key North American markets. And this is really a tremendous barrier to entry. I'd like to underscore that. It's virtually impossible to replicate the assets mm -hmm. that TC Energy has. It also owns and operates seven gas and nuclear plants around Canada and the United States. Now, to your point, Andy, there were two key developments that occurred last week for TC Energy. So they're both fresh and new. First of all, they announced asset sales. And so they announced that they'll be selling 40% of the Columbia pipeline uh, to a private equity group for $5 billion. Now, the purpose of this sale was to reduce debt. However, at first glance, the market really didn't like that because if you look at the multiple that they got for that, uh, the multiple was a little bit lower than what they paid for that very same asset back in 2016. Oh. The second reason that the market didn't like that announcement was because uh, you know, basically that announcement highlights the fact that the company is shifting from uh, a growth focus into more of a debt reduction focus. And it's tough for the market to get excited about reducing debt. It's much more excitable mm -hmm. uh, to talk about growth plans. The second major announcement that was uh, made last week was a spin-off of uh, the Liquids Group. Mm -hmm. And so uh, TC Energy will split into two groups. Uh, on the one side, they're going to have the Liquids Group. On the other side, they'll have the core business, uh, and that will be the, uh, the natural gas pipelines, the storage, and the power units. So we'll see how this all transpires going mm -hmm. forward. But we like the company even as it stands right now. Uh, it trades at basically a 10 times multiple. It has a dividend yield at you know, over 8%, hmm. uh, and so there's a lot to like. And Saputo, the cheese giant, uh, what attracts you here? Um, stock has been down lately. Stock has been down, absolutely. Uh, but it's Canada's largest uh, dairy manufacturer and distributor. Mm -hmm. It's number three in the U.S. and number 10 globally. It manufactures cheese, uh, butter, spreads, milk, and other dairy products. Uh, and they sell, they're very international. They sell their uh, products in over 60 countries. Uh, the U.S. is the largest percentage of sales followed by Canada and then international. Uh, now the stock has really sold off recently about 25% from 36 uh, to about $27. And the reason for that is that they missed their uh, earnings estimates and management provide a cautious outlook. All that being said, we feel that it's a high quality company. There's a good management team uh, that has a considerable amount of interest in the shares. Mm -hmm. So that ties their interest to minority shareholders. It trades an attractive multiple and it has a 2.6% dividend yield. So lots to like here on Saputo for the long term. Thank you very much, Robert. Welcome back to Market Call. It's time now for Top Picks, and we're starting with TD Bank. Now, we were talking about the banking sector earlier, and TD came up because it recently dropped out of the bidding process, reportedly, yeah. for Laurentian. So why do you like this name uh, over all the other banks? I think, you know, what I like this name, and I think what all the, the, the picks today will kind of uh, encompass is companies that uh, are able to play offense in a really tough environment. Mm. So in terms of TD, you know, there's been some negative headlines with TD um, over the short term. Um, 
and, and that's really negatively impacted the sentiment towards the name. So if you look at the valuation, you know, a discount to, to peers, you know, it's around 10 times earnings. That's not a position TD is in that much. Um, and if you look at their excess capital, you know, they have the most, uh, the highest uh, amount of excess capital of any Canadian bank. So mm -hmm. that really positions them well for a number of initiatives, right? They can buy back shares. They can pay, increase the dividends. Is that because of the deal that fell through? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they would have spent some of that capital uh, for the deal. Mm -hmm. and, and because some of the regulatory um, pressures in place, you know, uh, banks couldn't increase their dividends. So a lot of the banks had built up really big amounts of capital. And you saw BMO, be, you know, complete a U.S. acquisition. But, you know, TD wasn't able to. So they can return it to shareholders in other ways or, you know, another deal might come on the table. So I think that's where, you know, as the market's really volatile, you know, they have lots of options to, to play offense. How exposed are they to commercial real estate? Well, I think that's the one thing with the with the large Canadian banks. They always tend to be very well diversified, mm. you know, in terms of their exposures. And in terms of how they protect themselves, that's essentially, you know, through, through the collateral or the loan to value they have. Mm. So, you know, TD is a fairly conservative lender, so their sector exposure isn't, you know, outsized. Mm. And then they do have protection just in terms of the loan to value that they lend at. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next top pick, which is Yum China. So that's Y-U-M-C on the New York Stock Exchange. Why do you like this company? Yeah, this one, uh, kind of similar. Mm. You know, this one, um, you know, can play offense um, really aggressively now. And, you know, there's been some, some turmoil in China in, in their economy. And if you look at the balance sheet of Yum China, you know, they have uh, about $3 billion in net cash. And what they've been able to do, you know, even throughout COVID, um, is accelerate their store build out. And so, you know, this is a company that, because they had excess capital, uh, because they raised capital at a good time, they've been able to accelerate their growth profile over the longer term. And you, you're seeing this in the quarterly earnings, but you're not seeing the full impact of this yet. You know, this will be seen five and 10 years down the road because uh, this company has a fantastic pipeline uh, of stores coming online. Mm. And so in terms of, you know, what's so good about them, like they've got a, a wonderful management team. The digital capabilities are almost unparalleled uh, in terms of um, this space. You know, they've got more than 400 million people. Like that's more than the entire US population that, that, that um, you know, uses their, their app. And I think that's, uh, you know, that digital, it's kind of best in class digital capabilities with a great management team and, and a super strong balance sheet. Mm -hmm. I am seeing some criticism that, uh, they, they, that while they will accelerate their store build out, it will be in so-called lower tier cities. What do you make of that concern? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're gonna accelerate growth wherever they can. Right. And, and Ch China is such a massive population mm -hmm. base. You know, their second tier cities are bigger than, <laughs> than our, the largest cities in North America. And so, you know, where they build and how they build, I'm less, concerned about, you know, they're, they're, they're smaller stores. The one thing that, that does sometimes concern people too is just they are the largest restaurant operator in China. You know, any type of inputs, like would they have problems securing chicken supply? So mm -hmm. they've become more vertically integrated over time just to ensure that they have the inputs. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, China's a massive population base and their, and their store base is, is massive as well. Okay, let's go to the final one. We'll squeeze it in. CGI Inc. Uh, what appeals to you about this name? Yeah, so I think this one is, is a pretty simple one. You know, um, as companies, you know, there's a lot more pressure for companies to be efficient and, and digitization is how they do it. And so, you know, with CGI, their focus is IT outsourcing and consulting. So they, they fit right into this sweet spot. Uh, so in terms of its valuation, you know, very attractive valuation, very attractive free cash flow yield. And I think the one knock sometimes people have on it is that it doesn't pay a dividend, mm. but they're very, very good on allocating capital. And, and so I think that, you know, them not paying a dividend is, is not an issue with me. This is a phenomenal compounder at a very reasonable price. Beckton Dickinson is Lauren's first idea. Sure, so a lot of people don't know this company, but Beckton Dickinson is a healthcare provider, Andy, of various different supplies and devices, things like catheters, syringes, pumps. 90% of their products are disposable, uh, so there is a recurring revenue theme there, but uh, during COVID, a lot of uh, elective surgeries were put on hold, and so the stock uh, trailed a little bit. But looking forward, this company's got double-digit earnings growth uh, for the next number of years. They only have a 25% market share, but they're the major player in their business. They've done a fantastic job making acquisitions. Um, 
they're going to grow their dividend on a regular basis and uh, fantastic earnings growth going forward, a great franchise. Corteva, is it an animal health name? or No, Cor Corteva, yes. Corteva is a seed and crop oh, protection yeah. company, competes with Monsanto. They've avoided you know, the issues Monsanto's had, now owned by Bayer with Roundup and the like. Corteva was spun out of Dow DuPont a few years ago. Um, great margins, double-digit earnings growth, a pristine balance sheet with minimal debt, and they're using their excess cash for acquisitions, share buybacks. Uh, the dividend is, you know, not, is relatively low at 1.1% or so but uh, poised to rise and just an incredibly well-run, unique business. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, you can see the agriculture stocks have been something of a disappointment. The fertilizer names are down, I can see Corteva is too. Um, I mean, one central um, metric for the agribusiness is the corn price. Maybe if we could put up a five-year corn sure, price. Sure, and, and that's going to be, a, that, that is certainly a huge uh, issue, especially for the fertilizer companies. Mm -hmm. One of the things with uh, climate change and the like is that there is an increasing need uh, for seeds that need less water and can grow right. under difficult conditions. You know, we think about no GMOs in the West, but if you're in India and in a lot of poorer countries, you need something to avoid famines. You know, you, you need to grow rice that's going to be able to, to under different different mm -hmm. circumstances. And so, you know, this companies like this are, are badly needed, so they have a good growth trajectory mm -hmm. because of things like that. It is interesting as well, genetic modification. I know New Scientist magazine is often saying there's alarmism there and that genetically engineered seeds could bring a lot of benefits. Absolutely, especially to poor regions of the world. Not everybody can, you know, spend a dollar buying an organic carrot. Okay. Johnson and uh, Johnson, um, I'm not sure, I can't even remember if they put the talc litigation behind them, but you see upside here. Right, the talc litigation is ongoing. They're trying to put it behind them, okay. and there there's a, was a court case that they lost, and they're now appealing, but they've already put $9 billion on the sidelines for that talc litigation. So, you know, one way or another, maybe it'll cost them a few billion dollars more, but this is a $400 billion plus market cap company. So we're, we're not concerned about how long that goes on for. J&J &J is going through a, a major change right now. They've spun out their consumer products business hmm. into another public company called Kenview. Oh, okay. They're well known for the consumer products, but it's only about 15 or 16 percent of the business. Hmm. And so that will be spun out to shareholders uh, over the next while. Um, and so you're going to be left with a pharma and medical device company. And J&J uh, &J at 16 times earnings, 60 consecutive years of dividend increases. One of two companies left in the S&P 500 with a AAA credit rating. Microsoft oh, is the other. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, phenomenally well-run business, continuing on a reasonable growth path. At 16 times earnings, I, I mean, I, to buy one of the world's best businesses with that kind of track record and great management is a great opportunity. Is the stock going to, you know, triple in the next five years? It will not. But boy, continued great dividend income and steady growth. That's interesting. Um, almost a buy and forget stock. I know no stock is quite that. No, but I have yeah. to say, Andy, and I, and I use an example, and there was a great report uh, done out of the U.S. Um, which talked about how the bond market is rational. High yield bonds do much better than, than regular bonds, but the stock market is irrational because quality stocks have outperformed riskier stocks. Hmm. And quality has done, and Warren Buffett figured this out a long time ago. Yeah, just buy the quality company and hold it forever. That's his favorite period. Exactly. But anyway, yeah. Lauren, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Great. For, thank you so much for having me, Andy. Great to be here. Thanks for watching Market Call this week. If you are celebrating a long weekend, have a great time. Get out into the woods. Don't be just lying on your back looking at your phone. And we'll be back on Tuesday.